Good morning, everybody. I am very excited to share this session with you where we're going to be discussing lease agreements, specifically the do's and don'ts. Because the truth about a lease agreement is if you do not have the correct information and detail in your lease agreement with the correct clauses, giving the landlord as well as the tenant the necessary protection in the lease agreement, you will definitely run into a few problems and we are going to avoid that by using the correct documentation when we do lease agreements. So I am Silna Stein, I'm the Managing Director of SSLR Incorporated. We're a firm dedicated to property law and I am honored uh, to, to do this talk and to give you some more information on lease agreements. So I also want to thank Private Property again for inviting me to host this session. So let's get straight into it. Usually when it comes to a lease agreement, the question is, what is important? Can I use my own lease agreement? Can I buy a lease agreement from CNA? Can I download a lease agreement from the internet? What is safe and what is going to give me the necessary protection when it comes to lease agreements? So first off, we need to appreciate that the South African legal system is a separate system from any other legal system in the world because every country has its own legal system. So one of the biggest things that I find um, to be a very big problem when it comes to lease agreements is if you hop onto the internet and you Google lease agreements, you're definitely going to be able to download a bunch of lease agreements, but it could very well be lease agreements drafted by an attorney in a completely different country. So say, for instance, you end up with a lease agreement based on the English legal system. The content of that lease agreement will be completely irrelevant to what you are doing, and it will not just be not helpful, it will actually be prejudicial to what you are doing. And this is something very important to keep in mind. When we deal with lease agreements, the most important thing is to appreciate that this is not a document that can quickly be drafted on the back of a cigarette box. Uh, at least we're now in level one, so I can make cigarette box jokes again. But um, it's very important to appreciate the fact that this is a very specific legal document and if you as the landlord want to use a lease agreement you need to appreciate that this is the document that gives your right of occupation away to a third party. You need to protect yourself and your investment in every potential aspect of a rental to the point where you don't have to go back at a later stage to amend something or change something, it's really important to be aware of this. So first off, must the lease agreement be in writing or can it be a verbal agreement? At this stage, in terms of the Rental Housing Act, a residential lease agreement may be verbal or if the tenant requests that it must be in writing, it has to be in writing. Commercial agreements are not regulated by the Rental Housing Act um, so even if the tenant requests it to be in writing, there's no legislation allowing the tenant, forcing the tenant, um, uh, forcing the landlord to have the lease agreement in writing. So having said this, it's important to be aware of the fact that the Rental Housing Amendment Act, which has not been promulgated yet, and I cannot see um, that it will be promulgated in its current form, however anything is possible. Um, but the Rental Housing Amendment Act, which was published already in November 2015, still not promulgated to this day, yes, it's been a good five years. Um, so that piece of legislation does require lease agreements to be in writing. But why do we currently do lease agreements if, in writing if it can be verbal agreements? Well, that makes a lot of sense. To do it in writing because I don't know about you but I can barely remember what I had for breakfast so imagine a year from entering into a lease agreement a verbal lease agreement you suddenly in a position where you have to recall the exact provisions of the lease agreement that you agree to verbally with the tenant the problem is 
Even if you can remember, and even if the tenant can remember what the content of the verbal agreement was, the way we prove that in court is on oral evidence. That means somebody gets into the witness stand and you can cross-examine him to get to the actual content of the lease agreement. Why this is not advisable is if we have to do an eviction, which in fairness is what we are all concerned about when we do rentals. If we have to do an eviction, we want to bring an eviction on application. So now I'm going to bore you a little with civil procedure law because we have two options in South African law when we initiate court proceedings. On the one hand, we can go on action, which means we commence the proceedings with a summons, or we can go on application, which means we commence the proceedings on a notice of motion with a founding affidavit. If you have a factual dispute, or if you are in a, in a situation where you have to prove the terms of the lease agreement verbally, the only option is to bring it on oral evidence, and that will mean that we have to go on trial. So why is this a problem? On motion, on application, we can be in court with an eviction in anything between uh, two to three months, or sometimes shorter, but currently, uh, with the lockdown regulations, we are still a little limited and the roles, court roles are still very congested. So if that is the situation, but we have to go on trial, we're only going to be in court in about a year or two from now. So if you have your lease agreement in writing and complete, where all the parties know exactly what they've agreed to, we can go on application and your eviction process will be much, much quicker. This is why we have it in writing also. If there's a dispute when it comes to a, a, any, any contract, any agreement, there's a rule of interpretation that says the contract must be interpreted against the party responsible for the drafting. So even if it's in writing, but you do not have the necessary provisions with regards to interpretation of that particular contract, you can run into very, very severe problems. For instance, a landlord that does something a little creative or funny, uh, whatever you want to, want to call it, it could very well have the effect that that contract is interpreted against the landlord and in favor of the tenant. And why I'm saying this is, remember, the landlord in a lease agreement will always be the party uh, representing the terms of the um, agreement to the tenant and the tenant can then accept those terms or uh, reject those terms and that is when the agreement comes into being. So it's very important. So I used a lot of time to explain why we need to have our lease agreements in writing and this is something crucial. Please keep that in mind and don't try and do a verbal agreement because it does become very difficult to prove the terms of that contract. But Let's get into a few important things and then I'm going to break it down into a, a few takeaway points on do's and don'ts. But for the moment, the easiest way and the best way of dealing with a lease agreement is to get a lease agreement that is used by as many as possible users in the country. I am honored and privileged to be the drafting attorney of the TPN Leesburg Residential Lease. Um, I've been responsible for the drafting for the past uh, six years. And I'm very excited to see how many users we currently have. At this stage, the majority of uh, South African lease agreements, written lease agreements, are actually used, um, uh, does use the, the, either the unamended form of the lease pack or at least a, a similar or older version of this lease agreement. Why this is relevant is, one of the bigger problems with rentals is that neither landlord nor tenant understands the actual intricate terms of lease agreements. So what happens is, if we have a standardized document, suddenly people get comfortable. Imagine for a moment, you are a tenant and you're renting the property through an agency and they're using a document that is based on the TPN lease back. But then for the next term, you're renting a property directly from a landlord. But the document, even though the branding on the document isn't with the agency that you used previously, the content of the document is 
exactly the same or at least very closely similar. You're comfortable with the content and the terms of this agreement. But even more importantly, judges and magistrates has to read the full content of an agreement if there's an agreement that forms the basis of a dispute or some or the other form of action, for instance, an eviction. And if that is the case, quickly imagine a judge with 60 matters on the roll in front of him for the day, of which, let's say, seven is evictions. A, res a residential lease agreement, if you really shrink it down as little as you can, is a 12 to 15 page document. The truth is you want a residential lease agreement to be more in the, in the region of about 17 to 20 pages, then I know you've, you've covered a lot of it. But if a judge has to read seven 12 to 15 page documents, with all respect um, to all our judges, there's physically not enough time to read it in that much detail. So what we're seeing is more and more judges and magistrates are asking us when we bring eviction applications if the lease agreement is based on the TPN lease back. This is absolutely fantastic because this means when a judge has standardized documents in front of him, the interpretation of those contracts and the actual decision on an eviction or a rental claim or whatever the dispute is, is obviously much quicker and much easier. My drive for standardization in the industry is something that I've been passionate about for a very long time. And I'm very excited to see we're getting to a point of standardization in lease agreements across national agencies and across landlords and that does their own um, management and their own rentals. So you are more than welcome to have a look at that. Uh, we are hosting our stand um, for this particular show with TBN. So you are welcome to visit us and have a look at what we are offering uh, for the industry in that in that sense, which will also make it much easier for you if you visit our YouTube channel, SSLR's YouTube channel, you will see that I, whenever I do training, whenever I record a video, I will always refer to the clauses in the lease pack that is relevant. So it makes it easier for everybody. And the truth is, I'll share this little secret with you. Actually, it's just so I can do one training session and I cover all the landlords and agents in one go by using the same lease agreements. So I'm not saying my standardization is uh, because I don't want to do multiple trainings. I just honestly do believe that that is the best for the, for the rental industry specifically. So let's get into a few do's and don'ts. I'm going to start with the don'ts because I love scaring people and then I leave you on a happy note. So the don'ts, very important. Ambiguity is the worst swear word that you will ever use when it comes to agreements. Ambiguity is when there are contradictions, for instance, in a contract. So on the one point you deal with subleasing and then the next moment, and you say subleasing is not allowed. And the next moment there's another clause saying that should you have a subtenant, the tenant will be responsible for the eviction of the delinquent subtenant. That causes ambiguity. Ambiguity's easy definition is that moment when you read something in a contract and you think, huh, this doesn't make sense. That is how you know something is ambiguous. Why is this a problem? If you do not have proper interpretation clauses, for instance, a severability clause, which says if there's any dispute between um, the, uh, specific clauses, you can read some of them as if they aren't in the contract while the rest of the clauses still stand. If you do not have a clause like that, the problem that you're running into is at some stage a judge can't make a decision on what the true intention of the parties were. Why I'm saying this is the moment you start amending a document, for instance, the lease back, you will run into a situation where you might not understand why there was a specific clause written into the agreement. And it could very well make the entire agreement in illegal or at least unenforceable in certain aspects. So it's very important to keep this in mind. Something else that's very important is not to include illegal provisions. So what am I talking about? I have seen lease agreements that made me so, so sad that does things, for instance, say, 
um, the provisions of the Prevention of Illegal Evictions Act will not apply to this tenant. Now that's illegal. We do not have the right to contract out of legislation. It's very important to, to keep this in mind. To do something like, say the CPA won't apply to this contract where it does, suddenly it leaves both parties in a situation where they have no idea what's going on. Does it apply? Does it not apply? We can't contract out of legislation. It's very important. No illegal provisions. It places the entire enforceability of the contract at risk. Then, at the same time, it's very risky to draft specific provisions of legislation into a contract. Why am I saying this? Say, for instance, you quote provisions of Section 14 of the Consumer Protection Act into your lease agreement. And that act gets amended. It will mean that there's provisions written into your contract that might be burdensome on the landlord or the tenant that was a legal requirement at some stage, but now it got amended and your contract won't amend with that. When we deal with legislation in contracts, we do it in a way that we don't basically copy and paste legislation into the contract. You make reference to it in a way that will amend should the legislation amend as well. Very important. Then the last scary one, and I promise this is the last one I'll scare you with, is your method of service. I still see contracts to this day that requires notices to be delivered by registered mail. There's no requirement in our law to have any notice delivered by registered mail um, when it comes to, to lease agreements. So, for instance, we don't have to send a letter of demand before we cancel a tenant to evict him. We don't have to send that by registered mail unless you specifically ask for that in the lease agreement. If the lease agreement says notice must be given by registered mail, then it must. So why do we burden ourselves with stuff like this? You are more than welcome to insert a provision that says any notices can be delivered by email and then deemed to be received on the day of dispatch. And never do funny things on that, like um, write something in to say, on receipt of a read receipt, it will be deemed delivered. Because that power is in the receiver's hands, so why would you do something like that? Keep it simple and make sure that your notices can be delivered in a simple, effective manner. Let's get to the dues, and I'll be relatively quick on this one. The Consumer Protection Act is a very important piece of legislation. You are welcome to visit um, our stand, the SSLR and TPN stand. I have a specific flowchart which you can download in PDF that will show you when the CPA will apply to a lease agreement or not. So I'll keep it very simple and that's why I don't have to explain it uh, because I've drafted something for you. Uh, I drew an, a nice little picture. Um, so if the Consumer Protection Act does apply to your lease agreement, there are very specific elements that's relevant. For instance, you need to give the tenant 20 business days before you can cancel the agreement if he is in breach of a provision of the agreement. And there's a lot of other things that becomes relevant <coughs> when the CPA applies. And the only thing that you need to know is whether it applies to your lease agreement or not. And if it does, make sure that you have a look over uh, Section 14 of the CPA and you really know that your lease agreement does incorporate all those provisions so you are sure that you do comply with the provisions of that particular piece of legislation. Then the only other one that I do think is very important is a lease agreement must cater for any circumstance. And I don't think there's ever been a better time to realize this than during COVID. The moment COVID hit, I was very, very, very pleased to look over the TPN lease back and realize we don't have to amend anything in the contract to make provisions for a situation like a state of disaster that we honestly never saw coming. You need to cater for situations like natural disasters, like a state of disaster without calling it something specific. Unfortunately, I've seen a lot of lease agreements currently specifically trying to deal with something like lockdowns and things like that. It's irrelevant and now suddenly you could very well exclude a future 
circumstance that we might not be aware of yet. I'm not jinxing it. I'm just saying a lease agreement must be something that is very standard and that can apply in absolutely any circumstance. The moment you need to cater for something overly specific, be careful about that. Be careful because if that circumstance doesn't occur, what are you not catering for? Because you are overing, over catering for something specific. It has to be open enough to cater for absolutely any eventuality that might occur during the subsistence of the lease agreement. Now, the truth about lease agreements is there are so much. And if I have to tell you everything um, about the do's and the don'ts in lease agreements, um, I don't think I'll be able to just do that in 20 minutes. I won't even be able to do that in three days. So what I do suggest is if you have any further questions, you're more than welcome to ask me now. If you want to have a direct specific conversation, you're more than welcome to visit the SSLR and TPN stand. There are quite a few of our attorneys as well as TPN's uh, legal advisors available at the stand to deal with any question that you ha might have with regards to lease agreements. I wish you all the best and uh, happy renting.